Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. Coming up this week, I give an update on the Benji Thomas pet lion. I just haven't found it. Ben says why he failed to spell his name in a recent exam. I didn't actually know what the definition of a tusk was, so that's pretty cool. And I look vaguely annoyed. Starting off the news this week is obviously the big story surrounding the UN COP26 conference. Like I said, we can't cover all of them and I strongly recommend trying to keep up with the major goings on in as much detail as you can. The talks are of course ongoing, but I'll quickly mention a couple of agreements that have come out at the time of writing. Although of course, this will probably be a little bit outdated by the time this goes out. One of the more important announcements that have come out comes in the form of an agreement of over 40 world leaders that have agreed to invest heavily in green energy technology, efficiency and, crucially, availability, especially in the five high carbon sectors that will be tackled first, which include the agriculture industry and electricity production. This plan aims to encourage private investment into cleaner technology, and this is the first time where something of this scale has been attempted across such a wide range of nations. Led by the UK, this group also includes the USA, the EU, India and China. The BBC reports that the nations in this deal represent over 70% of the world's economy and every region. Obviously, getting such a deal across such a wide range of important nations is extremely important, but the contents of the deal, and reports of further deals to encourage green energy, is incredibly important too. One of the reasons why this is so crucial is that by investing in the technology and making it more widely available and cheaper, means that developing nations will find that green energy will actually become simply a better alternative to high carbon industries. The aim is to make green energy the most efficient source of energy, so there will be little impetus to go with more dangerous forms. Another agreement that has been announced that I'll very quickly mention is a joint deal between over 100 nations to reduce methane emissions by 30% by 2030. There doesn't seem to be an actual list of these countries anywhere, but from what I can tell, the US and EU-led group is joined by the UK and Canada, but not by Russia, India or China. This isn't confirmed though, so hopefully a more concrete list of nations who've signed up to this will be released soon unless it has already been released and I just haven't found it. In other news, we have the amazing announcement that a new species of living whale has been found. Examining the genetics and morphology of a population of beaked whales living in the southern hemisphere, the study found that these whales, which had been classified under True's beaked whale, are distinct enough to have been named as Romari's beaked whale, Mesoplodon Aueu. The study finds that the two species started diverging from each other about 2 million years ago with gene flow stopping 0.35 to 0.55 million years ago and analysis of their skull morphology supports their distinction as separate species too. The paper also explains how their consultation with indigenous people of South Africa and New Zealand, where the strandings of the whales took place, can hopefully be used to set an example and show how involving such communities in the naming and descriptions of species can be beneficial. And now over to Ben. How's it going? Thanks, Doug. Well, up next we have a not at all controversial study naming a new species of prehistoric human. Meet Homo bodoensis. The reasoning for this new taxon being introduced is said to be because of the poorly defined species Homo heidelbergensis and Homo rhodesiensis failing to reflect the true diversity of hominins at this time in the Middle Pleistocene. As such, in addition to the introduction of a new species, the paper explains that many of the fossils from Western Europe that are currently assigned to Homo heidelbergensis should instead be referred to Homo neanderthalensis. Homo bodoensis is therefore named not based on any newly discovered material, but as a way to try and clean up the complicated mess of hominin taxonomy at this time, with the bodo skull from Ethiopia being the holotype specimen, and the species having a pan-African distribution that even stretched into the Mediterranean. However, not everyone agrees with this new classification, with a prominent paleoanthropologist in the Natural History Museum in London arguing that the naming of a new species was not necessary, especially as older names would take precedence over this newly created name anyway. He did state that only European specimens should probably be assigned to Homo heidelbergensis and ones from Africa should be classified as something else though, but yeah, basically in an effort to simplify hominin evolution, this paper has just made everything more complicated for everyone, but that's paleoanthropology really. 
Also in the news this week is a fascinating paper that investigates the evolution of tusks in mammals. The paper explains how tusks, which are defined as continuously growing incisors or canines composed of dentine, have convergently evolved multiple times within mammals but not in other animal groups, except for the non-mammalian synapsid group called the dicynodonts. The paper therefore suggests that there must be some kind of feature of mammals and mammal line synapsids that makes tusk development possible, and attempts to identify what these features are. Examining the tusks of 10 different dicynodonts and comparing them with true mammals, the researchers found that the features needed for tusks to evolve include highly reduced tooth replacement as well as a permanent soft tissue attachment between the teeth and the jaws. So, since these features are found in crown group mammals, this explains why they were able to convergently evolve so many times within this animal group, but not in others. A very interesting study that made me realise I didn't actually know what the definition of a tusk was, so that's pretty cool. Back to Dog in the Studio. Yeah, cheers Ben. Um, so that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next week.